This Republican Amazon leads young and old and all classes to the barricades. Here the top-hatted figure of some means, and here the pistol-packing student. At their feet, the dead, a Royalist National Guardsman, and this semi-naked figure, surely copied from Jéricho's Raft of the Medusa, that Delacroix knew so well. And it all takes place against the smoking backdrop of Paris, the Republican flag hanging from Notre Dame in the distance. And the colours used here? Red, white and blue, of course. There is perhaps no more iconic image in all of French history. And it didn't take long for the street fighting men and women commemorated by Delacroix to be at it again. As Karl Marx observed, history was repeating itself. Revolution in 1848 was, in that very French way, followed by reaction. The nephew of Napoleon, Louis Bonaparte, came to power by coup d'etat that ended the short-lived Second Republic. And like his uncle, he declared himself emperor of a second empire. At the heart of this empire would be a city of Grand Boulevard and buildings built by Baron Haussmann. And the Louvre was to become the symbol of a modernized Paris. In 1852, a new Louvre project was announced that would complete the Grand Dessin by connecting both sides of the Louvre to the Palace of the Tuileries. The old tenement buildings and stalls that had been part of the site for centuries were bulldozed to make way for this vision of the future. The Louvre was once more to be a focus for political power. The emperor would rule from here. It would be the site of government, with bureaucrats in the new wings working away for France. And it would be a symbol of French cultural power, with its magnificent museum. The sheer ambition of this project was explained to me by Daniel Soulier. We say in France that Napoleon really gave the full packet. It was a full-on imperial project. He threw limitless money, limitless people and limitless resources at it. The emperor had a hand in everything that happened in the Louvre. So all possibilities were open. He ordered that where the little town had sprung up here behind us, the Richelieu wing should be built, and the Dunant wing on the other side, over here. With these two new wings, he was able to enclose the space and create a courtyard of vast proportions right at the centre of the building. Grandeur on the outside was reinforced by opulence within. Again, no expense was spared. Just look at all this luxury. The walls, the fittings, the carpets and the furniture. What does it remind you of? Yes, Louis XIV and that was deliberate. This second empire style was a self-conscious and some said vulgar way of aping the Sun King. But Louis Bonaparte wanted everybody to know that his Louvre was as much a glittering reflection of his imperial eminence as any in the past. But the destruction of the old Louvre was mourned by one poet and critic. Charles Baudelaire was a regular visitor to the museum. It was a warm and comfortable place to meet his mother. He once took a five franc whore to look at the ancient statues. She professed to be scandalized by the nudity. Baudelaire was a great admirer and friend of Delacroix, who in 1851 had completed this ceiling in the Galerie d'Apollon. They were romantic soul brothers. 
Of the painter, he wrote, Delacroix was passionately in love with passion, but coldly determined to express passion as clearly as possible. But while Baudelaire loved the art inside the Louvre with passion, he hated what had happened outside. In 1857, a collection of his poems was published, The Flowers of Evil. In it, there's one poem, The Swan, which captures his melancholy over what had been lost here and elsewhere in Paris. The rickety tenements, the market stalls, and the poor in pocket, but rich in heart. Paris change. Marianne, dont ma melancholie n'a bougé. Paris changes, but in my melancholy, nothing has moved. New palaces, blocks, scaffoldings, old neighborhoods, everything for me is allegory, and my dear memories are heavier than stone. And so outside the Louvre, an image gives me pause. I think of my great swan, his gestures pained and mad, like other exiles, both ridiculous and sublime, gnawed by his endless longing. Baudelaire had lost his beloved Paris, but the city created by Haussmann for Louis Napoleon is one that you can still enjoy today. And I, for one, never failed to be impressed by its scale its straight lines and symmetry. But it wouldn't take long for the Emperor to lose the capital and with it his Louvre. In 1870, he entered into a disastrous war with Prussia. France was occupied and Paris put under siege. After military defeat, Louis Bonaparte left the Louvre for the last time and went into exile. In Paris, barricades went up for one final time as a commune was declared. The communards took control of the city in the spring of 1871. At first, it was all done in a traditionally festive mood, en fête. On the 16th of May, the communards knocked down the mock Roman column here on the Place Vendôme that had been erected as yet another tribute to Napoleon's military exploits. Then, round midnight, the revolutionary fiesta moved on. Around 300 communards broke into the cellars of the Grand Hotel du Louvre, where they helped themselves to the finest wines and smoked the most expensive and hugest cigars that they could find. But these May Days of Hope were also accompanied by intense fighting around the Louvre. A civil war between left and right turned bloody. On the 23rd of May, the Palace of the Tuileries was set on fire and its dome blown up with explosives. The place that had been home to kings, queens and emperors burned for 48 hours. The destruction of the Tuileries left a gaping hole that created this skyline with its clear views all the way to the Arc de Triomphe. As for the Louvre, I think that this was a defining moment. The residence of royals and emperors, the Tuileries, had always been the symbol of autocratic rule to Parisians. Yet the Louvre was by now a different place in the eyes of the people, so it was spared the torch. Perhaps the presence of publicly available art guaranteed its survival. Why destroy the People's Museum? That would be vandalism. And by the time a Third Republic was established in the 1870s, there was much more to be enjoyed in the museum. There were wonderful new paintings, donated by benefactors like the generous Duc de la Case. One of these is the Club Foot by Giuseppe di Ribera a 17th century portrait of disability. The boy smiles and reveals his broken teeth. He looks us straight in the eye 
He wants something. So look at his hand, holding a piece of paper, a begging letter. For the love of God, give me arms, it reads. And visitors could marvel at this fabulous marble statue, the winged victory of Samothrace, which had arrived from an excavation in the Aegean. Over 2,000 years old, it's a depiction of the Greek goddess Nike, thought to be celebrating a naval battle. She's got a kind of still beauty and grace, but a flowing drapery gives her dynamism and movement. I feel as if she could take wing at any time and fly through the miles of galleries. The Louvre was now established as a democratic space open and free to the public six days a week. And visitors from all over France and beyond were eager to visit this must-see part of the Paris experience. By the late 19th century, there was no question that Paris was the cultural capital of the world and that the Louvre was the most potent symbol of this domination. By now, it was well established as a public space open to all who wished to visit. The artists of the day would congregate in places like this, Café La Palette, and the Impressionists were the most regular visitors to the museum, taking their inspiration from the past to look, learn and copy. Here in the Louvre is a pastoral drawing by Degas, La Sortie du Bain. Here's a Monet. At the time, works like these were considered avant-garde, scandalous even, and as such, were rejected by the academy that still controlled the salon. So these painters were forced to exhibit in a salon des refusés. Here's a Pizarro. He once said to Cézanne that he'd be glad to see the Louvre burned down. But Cézanne himself valued the museum. He wrote to a friend, keep the best company, spend your days at the Louvre, which is just what he did. Cézanne loved to contemplate the work of Chardin, his visual language, his depiction of nature, the simplicity of his composition. And all of this he put into his own work. But composers could be similarly inspired. Claude Debussy stood in front of this painting, Embarkation for Cythera, by Jean-Antoine Watteau. Who wouldn't be captivated by the playful flirtatiousness of the couples? And who wouldn't be mesmerized by its mystery? Debussy saw all of this and wrote a piece for piano, L'Ile Joyeuse. And writers too enjoyed the museum, not only as a place of culture, but also as somewhere to meet friends, and even sometimes to meet lovers. The Louvre was a place of amorous assignation for the American writer Edith Wharton. This is where she met her lover, the Paris correspondent of the Times, Morton Fullerton. They used to send each other secret notes in the Paris postal system. It was a kind of early 20th century form of text messaging. One from Edith simply said, at the Louvre, one o'clock, under the shadow of Diana. And speaking of mysterious ladies, after all these many years, what had happened to you know who? The Mona Lisa, remained in the Royal Collection until the Revolution. Then in 1800, Napoleon demanded that she join him in his bedroom at the Palace of the Tuileries. So not tonight, Josephine. But in the 19th century, La Jaconde was back in the Louvre, now scrutinized by tortured Eastians. That smile on her face 
was surely the oh-so-cruel and mocking pout of the femme fatale.